Excellent, thank you. Uh, welcome to this evening's panel on female perpetrators during the Holocaust, an event that is co-sponsored by three research institutes at Royal Holloway University of London, those institutes being the Gender Institute, the Holocaust Research Institute, and the Centre for International Security. My name is Simone Giuliotti, and I'm Senior Lecturer in Holocaust Studies and Deputy Director of the Holocaust Research Institute. It's a pleasure, it's a pleasure and a privilege to, to chair the to panel, chair the which, panel. Uh, which brings together leading scholars of gender, war, conflict, and aspects of the Holocaust perpetration and unfolding across time and space. Although this panel explicitly advertised or focused on the Holocaust, we very much acknowledge that victims of the Nazi regime, its perpetrators and collaborators, uh, fell into many categories, including gay, lesbian and queer victims, uh, disabled, mentally ill, forced labourers, and that the perpetration of genocide occurred in many different locations. Panelists are welcome to share insights about the pathways, gender-specific involvement and impacts of Nazi persecution on all victim groups and the responses that they have prepared or which will come up come to their mind as they participate in the ensuing discussion. By way of format, I will introduce each panellist and then each of them will outline in three to four minutes their research preoccupations with respect to this panel's theme. We will then return to a panel discussion of pre-circulated questions before opening up the discussion to questions and answers from the audience. Now let me turn to the biographies presented in alphabetical order. Thank you so much. So first we have there from left to right in clockwise, the top left corner, Dr. Sarah Cushman. Sarah is director of the Holocaust Educational Foundation of Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois, and a lecturer in the history department at Northwestern. The Holocaust Educational Foundation of, of Northwestern University advances Holocaust education at the university level throughout the world by supporting scholarship and teaching. Dr. Cushman has been involved in Holocaust education and scholarship for two decades, serving as Director of Youth Education at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Centre of Long Island and as Head of Educational Programming at the Stressler Centre for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Clark University. Her research centres on women's experiences during the Holocaust and the history of the women's camp in Auschwitz-Birkenau. She's currently working on her first book, Auschwitz, the Women's Camp, which is an adaptation of her dissertation. Dr. Cushman has written several articles related to this topic, including an overview of the history of the women's camp, an analysis of Jewish women prisoner functionaries, and an exploration of women's experiences of sexual violence and sexual agency. Our second panelist is Professor Elizabeth Harvey on the top right hand corner. She is Professor of History at the University of Nottingham in the United Kingdom. She's published on the history of gender in 20th century Germany, particularly under National Socialism and in Nazi-occupied Europe, and on the history of photography. Her publications include Women in the Nazi East, Agents and Women, uh, Witnesses of Germanization, published by Yale University Press in 2003, and the recent edited volume, edited with Johannes uh, Huerter, Maiken Umbach, and Andreas Wirsching, uh, Private Life and Privacy in Nazi Germany with Cambridge University Press in 2019. Her current research is on the Nazi Labour Administration in the Second World War in relation to the labour conscription of German women and the conscription and coercion of foreign women workers. She's currently seconded as project lead to the project, producing the English, English language version of the multi-volume edition of documents on the Holocaust called Persecution and Murder of the European Jews by Nazi Germany, 1933 to 1945, published by de Gruyter. Our third panellist uh, is Wendy Lauer uh, in the bottom uh, and to the left uh, in the screen. Wendy is the William Rosenberg Senior Scholar at Yale University uh, this semester. Normally, she's the John K. Roth Professor of History and Director of the McGriblian Center for Human Rights at Claremont McKenna College in California, in the United States. Professor Lauer chairs the Academic Committee of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and served as acting director of the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies at the USHMM from 2016 to 2018. She's the author of Nazi Empire Building and the Holocaust in Ukraine from 2005, The Diary of Samuel Goldfard and the Holocaust in Galicia from 2011, and co-editor with Ray Brandon 
of the Shoah in Ukraine History Testimony Memorialization in 2008. Her book, Hitler's Furies, German Women in the Nazi Killing Fields, from, published in 2013, was a finalist for the National Book Award and has been translated into 23 languages. Her next book, The Ravine, A Family, A Photograph, A Holocaust Massacre Revealed, will be published this month in February 2021 by uh, Horton Mifflin Harcourt and a review has just appeared in the New York Times. Our final panellist is Laura Schoberg, a British Academy Global Professor of Politics and International Relations at Royal Holloway, University of London and Professor of Political Science at the University of Florida. Professor Schoberg holds a PhD in International Relations and Gender Studies as well as the Juris Doctorate in Law. Her research addresses issues of gender and security with uh, foci on politically violent women, feminist war theorising, sexuality and global politics and political methodology. She teaches, consults and lectures on gender and global politics and on international security. Her work has been published in more than 50 books and journals in political science, law, gender studies, international relations and geography. During her tenure at Royal Holloway as the British Academy Global Professor, She'll be working on a research project about sexual relations as international relations and building the Gender Institute. This research project asks about the ways that states are affected by and affect people's sexual relationships. Most of her research has addressed gender and international security, from politically violent women to theorising about war. Her recent publications include Women as Wartime Rapists from New York University Press 2016, the Routledge Handbook of Gender and Security, published in 2018 with Karen Gentry and Laura Shepard. And finally, Gender and Civilian Victimization in War, uh, written with Jessica Peet, published by Routledge in 2019. So it's a pleasure and a privilege once again to uh, welcome this very distinguished panel. And now I will call upon each panelist to introduce their research on gender and perpetrators, paying attention to themes, findings, uh, and related publications. And each uh, panelist will have around three to four minutes uh, to speak uh, to their research. So I will call on uh, Sarah first, if that's uh, okay with you. So before I get started, I'd just like to thank uh, Laura Schoberg for inviting me to be a part of this discussion. Uh, I'm really honored to be here with this uh, amazing panel of scholars. Um, who I also thank for being here. And thanks also, also to uh, Simone Giliotti for moderating our discussion and also to Josephine Carr for administrative and technical support. And finally, I wanna thank all the attendees for spending your time with us on, on what I think is a very important topic. My scholarship is always centered on women's historical experiences. As an undergraduate, I researched black women's experiences in the US, particularly in the 20th century. I explored how black women fiction writers illustrated black women's history as part of an informal effort to highlight the unique and underground ways that black women produced and shared knowledge. After a 10 year hiatus from the academy, I returned to graduate school to pursue a PhD in Holocaust history at the Strassler Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Clark University. I knew that I wanted to focus on some aspect of women's experiences during the Holocaust, but not solely on victims. I, I aim to explore intersections of race and gender as a dynamic space in which at least part of the Holocaust took place. When I learned that no one had written a history of the women's camp in Auschwitz, I jumped on the topic. In Auschwitz, a broad array of women found themselves in a variety of positions in a space that was predominantly female. Here was an opportunity to look at the ways women participated in and responded to genocide. Because there was a men's camp as well, there was also an opportunity for comparison, even as comparison was never at the center of my work. Three general groups of women, prisoners, prisoner functionaries, and SS-affiliated personnel lived and worked at Auschwitz. Each of these groups, however, was diverse. Among prisoners, there were Jews and Gentiles from most countries in Europe, but these categories were also diverse. Language, age, education, political perspective, previous socioeconomic status, all of these shaped how individuals responded to existence in Auschwitz as well as to each other. One response uh, among many was to try to secure privileged positions or functionary job as a capo or a block leader, uh, positions in which prisoners received more space, food, hygiene, power in exchange for daily operation of the camp. 
These positions offered prisoners a greater opportunity to survive. The deal, however, was not an easy one. Prisoners often had and, and many chose to treat other prisoners with, with violence. Again, this group was, was diverse in terms of both. Oh, I'm sorry, I think there's somebody out there who's um, mute, who's unmuted. If Yeah, and for some reason I can't that. mute her. Wendy, Wendy Koenig? Josephine, can you mute her? Great, thanks. So I'll just pick up. So um, the positions, uh, these positions, uh, so functionary positions offer or privileged positions offered prisoners a great opportunity, greater opportunity to survive. The deal, however, was not wasn't an easy one. Prisoners often had to, in many cases, chose to treat other prisoners with violence. Again, this group was diverse in terms of both behavior and background. Until recently, most of these posi positions in Auschwitz were thought to be uh, to be held by German criminal or antisocial prisoners. My research shows that some Jewish women were able to gain such positions with, within months, if not days, of the establishment of the women's section in Auschwitz at the end of March of 1942. Though survival was not guaranteed, the only Jewish women prisoners to survive Auschwitz who arrived before the spring of 1944 were women who secured such positions. Um, finally, and I will focus on these women for um, the rest of the discussion, there were women affiliated with the SS who filled several functions in Auschwitz, and those included guards, telecommunications experts, nurses, and SS wives. And I'll stop there. Great, excellent. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, our next panelist is Professor Elizabeth Harvey. I'd like you to join the conversation, please, responding, just introducing your research uh, concerns, please. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to uh, echo Sarah's thanks to the organizers. I'm delighted to be here and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Uh, if I'm to point, pinpoint um, a particular light bulb moment that triggered my work on German women who were involved in Germanization policies in Nazi-occupied Poland, it was in the early 1990s when I picked up a memoir by a woman called Hildegard Fritsch, in which she quite unapologetically um, talked about her time in, in occupied Poland as a BDM activist. She published this book in 1986. The title in English is Land My Land. Peasantry and Rural Service, BDM, Eastern Assignment, Settlement History in the East. So I'd been researching young German women nationalists in the 1920s and their involvement in anti-Polish borderlands activism. And suddenly I was reading about how a few years later such activism had given way to full-blown population displacement and colonization in the annexed territories of Western Poland with young women, young German women enthusiastically pitching in to support German settlers and to fend off the Poles. So 40 years on, Hildegard Fritsch was still gushing about what she and fellow activists from the Bund Deutsche Mädel had achieved in Western Poland. So this was my starting point. But in the 1990s, I was working in a, at a time when there were some quite important um, developments in historiography that were helping me develop my questions. And the first was the new research on Nazi perpetrators. So away from the, the generalizing and pathologizing tendencies towards specifics of who had done what to whom and where. And there was the work of Christopher Browning, um, the work of Klaus Michael Malmann and Gerhard Paul and many others. Um, they were rethinking the notion of the desk murderer. They were highlighting the ideological drive of these people, of these bureaucrats, their individual agency and the group dynamics of the bureaucrats of murder. And Christopher Browning and others added to, to this detailed knowledge of uh, the men who had perpetrated face-to-face -face murder in the mass shootings from summer 1941 onwards in the occupied territories of the Soviet Union and in the general government. So there was much new work on male perpetrators, but there was also some emerging work on female perpetrators, of women who had been involved in sterilization, um, in the so-called euthanasia program, there was work on women concentration camp guards and on SS wives. So that was one context for my work. The other was the growing debate about the wider roles played by women in Nazi Germany more generally. There was Claudia Kuhns's very suggestive but quite sweeping arguments about Nazi women cultivating a supposedly separate sphere. There was Gisela Bock's work on sterilization and her notion that the sexism of the Nazi state was a form of secondary racism. There was work by Dagmar Reza, Anne-Marie Tröger, Karol von Zaxer and others about mm. Nazi policies towards women and on German women's responses and their involvement in, in Nazism. 
So it's clear from all this that Nazism, Nazism despite its character as a masculinist and viciously anti-feminist regime, did offer German women many opportunities for careers. But this work was focused on the territory of the German Reich itself and didn't talk about what happened when um, Nazi Germany expanded in the Second World War. So my topic w was grew out of this curiosity about, so what happened about with German women who were involved in implementing Germanization in Poland. So I worked on settlement advisors and helpers, on teachers in schools and kindergartens, and I explored what they wrote at the time about what they were doing and what they told me about it personally in yes. interviews in the 1990s. And I was looking how far a system of racist domination enabled women, German women, to gain status and authority on the basis of being German. I was asking how far the boundaries between men's work and women's work became blurred or, or, or stayed in place in the context of this territorial expansion. And I was asking how far German women who were sent to this frontier zone were expected or allowed to join in the violence against Poles and Jews. This was the work that uh, I then published in 2003 in Women in the Nazi East, Agents and Witnesses. And I'll stop there and I hope I'll be able to pick up more points later on. Great. Thank you so much, Professor Harvey. Now I would like to welcome Professor Wendy Lauer to talk about uh, her research. Wendy, if you're there, please. Okay, great. Thank you. You know, I'm, I um, want to uh, acknowledge uh, how much uh, Professor Harvey has influenced my um, uh, work on gender and on uh, German women as perpetrators. Um, her work on Nazi uh, the women who went east were, was absolutely formative in my thinking at a time. I think we had similar trajectories, actually. Uh, a couple of things that uh, I just want to add to uh, her presentation was the fact that the scholarship as it moved east, you know, once we were able to put ordinary German women on the map of what were the kind of killing sites and the sites of the mass crimes of the Holocaust, as Liz did in her work, um, and that was also propelled with a kind of post-colonial approach. We started to look at women and the Nazi um, occupation of the East as a kind of colonial project. And once we opened up that understanding of the presence of ordinary Germans in these occupation zones as a full-on kind of demographic revolution, women and even the Hitler youth and full families, German families, you know, then became part of the social history of of those sites, of those spaces uh, of the Holocaust um, in Eastern Europe. So that was something that was another, uh, I think, another part of our, our common trajectory. And, and that grew out of my early work on Nazi empire building the Holocaust in Ukraine. I think also, um, as we were working on this in the 90s, the field of genocide studies started to also uh, develop. And uh, we looked at more sociologically at issues of um, uh, of genocide and participation in genocide more broadly, um, and that involved women um, as, as participants. Uh, I think we were also influenced, I was, um, in the rise of feminist uh, studies and feminist interpretations of the history that restored agency to women and placed women in history, um, that blind spot that was so persistent. So suddenly we started to think about agency as it intersected with the crimes of the Holocaust and perpetration um, as uh, uh, the act of killing and the agency of that. What are the roots of that? What are the ideas driving it? And what are women actually doing in that in that pro in that so-called project? Um, and uh, Professor Harvey mentioned perpetrator studies more generally and how it was so focused on men who were predominantly the perpetrators, but not looking more at a more nuanced way at women's roles and their interactions with their male um, partners, not as a uh, kind of binary formulation of separate spheres, but as, as Liz mentioned, the kind of blurring that was um, going on both in relationships and how that those relationships could escalate or could de-escalate um, in a particular um, uh, situation. And I guess I, the last thing I would add is the issue of testimony and that um, we had an um, increasing number of testimony source material um, and we started to uh, pursue different ways of analyzing it, um, not only victim testimony, but perpetrator testimony. And one moment for me that was really um, important in terms of this subject grabbing my attention and, 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 um, and keeping it for a long time um, 
was the testimony of women in these kind of West German cases, in these East German cases, and all, you know, various investigations after the war, um, and the fact that that material had been utilized on uh, the thick descriptions of events that women gave, similar to the memoir that uh, Professor Harvey was talking about, but rather unfiltered, rather kind of unabashed, um, the continuity of their convictions of anti-Semitism. Um, and that was important for registering, I think, for his, me at least, and historians, that this testimony of women had to be taken very seriously. So that's, that's all I would like to add at the moment. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Wendy. So we will uh, continue now to uh, Laura Schoberg. Sure. Thanks. And I'm really honored to be on the panel with all three of the other panelists whose work really uh, influenced mine and made me think a lot and is great and fascinating. Um, I come from a slightly different background in politics and international relations with a general interest in significations and representations and frames of women's political violence. So to me, I came to reading about female perpetrators in the Holocaust um, as one of a number of cases in general research on women's perpetration, particularly in terms of how women's perpetration is framed and understood in both the mainstream media and academic literature, particularly academic literature and politics. Uh, so uh, we've done some work uh, mapping out three major narratives of the framing of women's violence that simultaneously blame women's violence on an exaggeration or exaggerations of femininity, separate violent women from real women, uh, real with scare quotes, obviously, and also separate violent women from their agency and their violence. Um, although we've tried to complicate notions of agencies. So those narratives that we found, uh, we, we call them mother monster and horror narratives. Um, and the mother narrative is about how women's loss of husbands or sons or their need to mother uh, people cause them to get involved in violent political organizations and do political violence. The monster narratives kind of come from I don't know those of you who are familiar with the phrase kill the women first, which is the idea that violent women are scarier than violent men uh, because vi there's some normalization to violent men, but something terribly psychologically broken and really scary about violent women. Um, and then the horror narratives are about uh, the word used in some of the terrorism studies language, literature is erotomania. So the notion that politically violent women are also sex crazed um, and that it's their sex craziness that drives their violence craziness um, or the other way around. Um, in this narrative are also notions that women are uh, unable to perform heteronormative sexual functions and therefore violent. Um, so it kind of goes either sex crazed or sexually inadequate, um, and they both kind of fall in these stories. Um, so I wrote a book a couple of years ago called Women as Wartime Rapist uh, that was particularly interested in these framings of women's sexual violence during war and conflict. Um, and then also kind of work on women's political violence more generally. And I found a number of the representations of these narratives in studies of female perpetrators of the Holocaust. Um, so one of the examples of the monster narrative are the stories of Herta Oberhauser and the kind of surgeries and the collections of skin and things like that. Um, and often she's talked about as someone uh, nuts and psychologically unstable in many of the same terms as the monster narrative is used other places. Um, the, also, there are a number of instantiations that we would classify as the horror narrative, particularly talking about commandants and other soldiers' wives being under the sexual control of those soldiers and therefore committing the crimes that they committed um, kind of around those. And then uh, there's also instances of the mother narrative, particularly in how nurses would justify their uh, participation in eugenics programs and things like that. Um, so we kind of find all of these narratives 
in the academic and kind of mainstream media coverage of some of the you know, per- perpetrators of the Holocaust. So that's where I come to this research from um, and have kind of engaged with a lot of the histories of it related to trying to understand how it's framed and compacted and understood um, as people read and, and digest it. So I'll leave it there for now. Excellent. Thank you so much, Laura. And uh, while I have you, I mean, I think we can start with the questions uh, now that we'll pose to the uh, panel and uh, for people to uh, answer these questions. And I'll put them into the chat as well. But, um, Laura, uh, the first question I'd like to put to the panel um, is what, if anything, does gender have to do with perpetration? You foregrounded, um, you know, several of the studies that you've done, but also they're across different, uh, you know, time and space. So this is the opening uh, question that I'll pose. So Laura, would you mind kind of starting off with that? Sure. I think that to me, one of the things that's strange sometimes about theories of political violence is that they were written thinking that men were the only people who do political violence. And some people try and stretch those theories to include women. Some people try and make a different theory of women committing political violence as if women would do it for completely different reasons than men would possibly do it. To me, gender analysis as a whole is important to apply to these questions. So women and men and gender non-binary people who commit political violence here in Holocaust context and more generally do so in a gendered world. In a gendered world that's full of gendered power, gender tropes, gender-based expectations of behavior. Um, And I didn't think we can understand anyone's perpetration without understanding the gender role expectations and gendered framings in which they live. Um, So to me, that's something that's kind of important to think about, because across most of the contexts that we do research, there are gender trope expectations, even though they differ pretty significantly in different contexts. So to me, when I'm interested in why someone perpetrates, I want to know a little bit about the gendered atmosphere in which they live as a kind of starting point for understanding what's going on. That's really interesting. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to invite the other panelists now to uh, answer that question. What, if anything, does gender have to do with perpetration? So, Wendy, would you like to comment, please? Uh, well, I think it really has like everything to do with perpetration because we're talking about behavior of uh, men and women that is already, as as Laura mentioned, kind of predefined by existing cultural contexts of what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman. And how violence, um, in this, in the case of violence um, as a topic, um, how that is filtered through that kind of lens. Um, I mean, all historical events and phenomena, um, including genocide, are gendered. They're driven by concepts of manhood and femininity and biological procreation. And um, and I think that you know, in our study of the Holocaust, where we've kind of lined up or genocide more broadly, um, these various isms, right? Imperialism, nationalism, racism, militarism, that sexism is, you know, a part of that. And um, that was, you know, in studies of sexism and feminist literature, uh, we've seen that kind of narrative, but it didn't quite kind of make its inroads into genocide studies or or uh, theories of of the Holocaust until uh, rather recently. Um, And so we could pose a lot of questions um, uh, older questions uh, anew. Um, one could write a history of the Holocaust that charts escalating um, persecution as that led to sexualized mass murder. You know, you could say, okay, at this point, the Nazi leaders, all men, removed Jews from the civil service, impacting male heads of household, forcing German women or Jewish women into new roles. You know, so we could kind of um, write that history um, in that way. Um, but I wouldn't, you know, and that should be done, I think. Um, but once I think we would get to that point, we would also then want to think about how important it is to show the intersectionality of these um, of these various categories, whether they're gender categories or these isms. To what extent does the gendered um, lens, you know, tell us more about the imperialistic drive of the Nazis or their nationalism or their racism or their militarism? Um, so I, you know, would make the the plea for a kind of rethinking of Holocaust history with these kinds of um, uh, uh, questions. 
Great. Yes, thank, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so, Liz, would you like to comment, please, uh, based on your research? Of what, if anything, does gender have to do with perpetration? Well, I think I'd definitely echo what the previous two speakers have, have, have talked about, about the, the you know, that everything has a gender, everything can be seen through a gendered lens. Perhaps I would also just add, um, in specific, specifically, if we're talking about Nazi crimes, the, the Holocaust, but other, also crimes committed against the populations of the occupied territories and against against Germans who were thought to be unworthy to live. Um, these were crimes for which the, the whole of German society was potentially being mobilised. I mean, they were they were it, 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 so to speak. The, the Volksgemeinschaft was was to be mobilised in pursuit of these crimes, and therefore it that they are that there's an in, there's an enormous division of labour going on and an enormous spread of institutions and agencies involved in these projects, if you like. And I think if one is then trying to sort of break down, okay, where are the women? Or where where is gender? Um, which parts of this enterprise are being <clears throat> decided upon and executed solely by men? Which parts of these projects, so to speak, require women to be involved, allow women to be involved? And I think, you know, just, just for example, um, I mean, and of course, it's not just Nazi gender ideology that determines where women are and what they can do. It's it's longstanding cultural conventions about what capacities and and, and roles of, of men and women. But <clears throat> I mean, for instance, women are clearly needed as propagandists uh, to spread lies about about Jews, about Poles, about inferior peoples. Um, they're also required to be part, as Wendy just explained, of the of the German colonizing enterprise. Um, you can't build an empire without women and families. Women, the presence of women and, and families in a colonized territory um, indicates that you're there to stay. It indicates that um, it, it gives you a sort of picture of what you're fighting for. And in the case of the colonization of Poland with German settlers, it gives an urgent imperative and an additional drive to the drive to expropriate and displace the Poles and the Jews because you needed their space, you needed their property, you needed their land um, to give to the German settlers. So women were part of that, but they were not, you know, for obvious reasons, um, in promoted positions in the ministerial bureaucracies that were drawing up the blueprints and and, and the laws that excluded Jews, um, and, and 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 put you know uh, you know paved the way for youth, euthanasia killings. Um, women, you know, Rachel Century, she you know we we know the women were there in the Reich Security Main Office, but they were typing and they were not deciding. So I think we can. You could, we can play through the different, as it were, institutions and agencies involved together in, in, in bringing about these crimes and, in, and, and ask where the women are allowed to be, where they push to be, where they are excluded from. And of course, when we come to the actual face-to-face -face killing, the general men retain more or less. But of course, Wendy has shown where that, that wobbles and where that doesn't, it doesn't hold true in the end. On the whole, they they retain the monopoly of violence, um, but of course, in these exceptional territories in in the occupied East, where, like she says, you know, the world turns upside down, and in, in a way, this this territory of impunity, women can also get drawn into, and they push their way into um, more direct acts of violence. That's great. Thank you very much. I mean, there's a lot to unpack in uh, each of the responses uh, so far. So before doing that, uh, I'll ask Sarah for her comments, please. Sure, thank you. Um, so basically, I agree with everybody. So I'm going to say approximately the same thing in a slightly different way. So um, uh, it, this probably goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyways. Um, you know, sex, biological sex um, has little to do with perpetration. And what I mean is that I don't think women are essentially or biologically any more or less likely than men to perpetrate anything. Um, and gender, I think, is a different story um, if we understand it as, as well. Let me I'll skip that part. Um, uh, gender roles shaped opportunities available to men and women 
in Nazi Germany and during the Holocaust, as well as how appealing various opportunities were. Um, and just for example, um, women could not serve in most positions in the military and the SS, and these were the two largest groups responsible for carrying out the actual genocide. Um, some military and civilian roles related to ethnic cleansing in the East were available to women, and many women seemed to have jumped at these opportunities, which were understood as advancing German racist and racialized policies. And these are the roles that um, Elizabeth and, and Wendy describe and analyze so brilliantly in their, in their, um, in their work. Um, most of these positions were white collar, but some offered violence at the margins of workplace. And some women took initiative, participate or instigate violence. Um, concentration camp service seems to have been uh, much less appealing to women. Um, while, while some women volunteered for this work, there was always a shortage of women guards and eventually the SS had to resort to conscription. Um, this was not a problem for men. Men, men often sought uh, the camp guard jobs as a way to avoid the front. So camp jobs are very appealing to men, not so appealing uh, for for women. Um, even so, for women in the Guard Corps, violence was a part of the job, and few of those who took up the role, whether as volunteer or as conscript, refused to participate in violence. In fact, many displayed a violent creativity that par paralleled that of their male counterparts. Uh, humiliation, degradation, psychological and physical torture, including sexualized violence at the hands of women guards, were among the quotidian experience, experiences of camp internees. Um, still, gender limited some of the forms of violence that women participated in. Alyssa Mylander uh, has shown, for example, that women guards in my Majdanek, even though issued guns, did not shoot prisoners. And we see the same kind of thing happening in Auschwitz as well. Women use their pistols, but they use them to beat prisoners, not to shoot them. Um, so shooting, uh, actually using the gun for its purpose, seems to have been an option available to men only. And I'll stop, I'll stop there. Uh, thanks so much, Sarah. Sarah, would you mind starting us off on the next question? Uh, by what routes did women become perpetrators? Because I mean, each of the responses so far is locating, uh, you know, women's actions in particular structures and spaces. So it might be good to uh, start with this question about the routes uh, by which women became perpetrators, paying attention to biography, social structure, occupations, etc. So. Sure. So, um, yeah, so I'll focus on Auschwitz. And in Auschwitz, women affiliated with the SS filled several roles, as I mentioned before, guards, telecommunication experts, nurses and wives. The only group that seems to have had no regular contact with prisoners were the telecommunications corps, the so-called Helferinnen or SS auxiliaries. They had, in short, they had no opportunity to be violent. Um, nurses interacted regularly with some prisoners. Most of them were male and most of them were Polish. Um, and these were in the SS infirmaries. There seems to have been little violence toward prisoners in, uh, in this particular context. Uh, most women guards, as probably many of you know, uh, had regular and ongoing association with women prisoners, and they used physical, psychological, and sexualized violence against them. They regularly participated in gas chamber selections of Jewish prisoners, um, vi both violence, um, the daily violence and the gas chamber selections often led to immediate or imminent death, and both could be characterized as murderous genocidal violence. Uh, SS wives utilized prison, prisoner labor, primarily of Jehovah's Witnesses, in their homes for child care and other household tasks. These, were, these relationships were by nature exploitative. The inmates had no choice in the matter and were not paid for their labor. At the same time, these arrangements seemed to have been largely free of physical violence, uh, less debilitating than many other work assignments, and offered the internees uh, greater access to food and hygiene, um, access that was critical to survival. So in short, women guards seem to have been, it's been almost universally brutal toward prisoners with some variation based on responsibilities and relationships with the prisoners they were interacting with. Wives were generally exploitative, but not necessarily violent, while telecommunications experts and nurses had little opportunity to be violent. My research indicates, however, that when the opportunity arose for women in these last two categories, so telecommunications experts and nurses, that they, they displayed um, similar levels of violence to camp guards. Um, I uncovered evidence that um, that briefly after the women's camp transferred from Auschwitz to Birkenau in August of 1942, camp nurses worked in prisoner infirmaries. Uh, one camp nurse who eventually connected with the resistance movement in Auschwitz testified that another nurse beat starving women with a whip. Um, very soon thereafter, camp nurses were recalled from prisoner infirmary, infirmaries. Um, so, but there is some indication from at least this one testimony that um, that some women from this eclectic group of nurses uh, would behave would behave brutally if given the chance. Um, 
In mid-January 1945, as Auschwitz was evacuated with the approach of the Soviet army, one of the telecommunications women was pulled into guarding a group of women prisoners uh, as they evacuated the camp. Um, these were among the evacuations that eventually became known as death, market, mar death marches. And so I would say that this is circumstantial evidence that um, that uh, someone, that a woman from this uh, telecommunications corps may have become violent at one point in her career. I'll stop there. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much. That's uh, yeah, it's a lot of uh, information to think about in terms of opportunistic situational participation and also talking about the broader approach, I think, in purpose trader studies about the biographical uh, kind of uh, studies that try to map out routes to uh, criminal wrongdoing or participation. So, uh, Liz, I'd like your insight, please, on that question, by what routes did women become perpetrators? Okay, thank you. Um, I've got a few comments that relate, I think, to the broader picture of female perpetrators, including concentration camp guards, so sort of trying to pick up on what Sarah's just said, and a few comments that relate more directly to what I talk about. I mean, the women that I work on were, on the whole, not violent perpetrators, but they were involved. They were perhaps more what you might call accomplices um, of, of uh, yeah, um, essentially uh, robbery and exclusion, displacement, dispossession. But just in terms of the, for instance, in the, in, the, in the case of the concentration camp guards, I wonder what, perhaps Sarah could sort of comment on this, what difference it made, or perhaps it made no difference, to whether due to the short, given that the shortage of, a relative shortage of, of, of personnel um, in terms of women as concentration camp guards, whether it made much difference to how they behaved if they had actually volunteered and gone, gone willingly into this, this role, or whether they'd been more or less nudged, pushed, conscripted by their employers into a role as overseeing um, women prisoners working often in, in, in sub camps. Because I, I, I've, I've picked up in, in the literature a little bit of a sense that perhaps morale and enthusiasm was not quite and commitment to the 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 Nazi project was not not as strong amongst these conscripts and therefore that gave perhaps opportunities for prisoners to, to survive and to withstand the experience um, if their guards were, were were perhaps less violent because less committed now maybe that's maybe that's Maybe I've got that wrong, but I would be interested at, at some point if somebody could pick that up, if Sarah could perhaps could pick that up and say if she if it, if she has the impression that that's a, a hypothesis. So in a sense that the sort of ideological drive that might have led people into these roles in the first place also affected how they behaved once they were in them. Um, I'm also interested, just on a slightly different tack, in the sort of professional routes into becoming perpetrators, where particular cultures of obedience, for instance, in, in, in nursing, in, in hospitals, or particular cultures of perhaps disdain or scorn for the clients of social welfare, um, could then interact with Nazi ideology to make, you know, social welfare experts willing to send youngsters to quite brutal correctional facilities or even later to, 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 to concentration camps, or health workers to um, collaborate in um, pushing candidates for, for sterilization toward, towards the, the, uh, the coercive operation. Um, so I feel that sort of professional cultures and professional, as it were, pre, sort of pre-existing dispositions towards particular attitudes towards, towards clients then meshed with Nazism to make, um, to make it possible for these people in these so-called caring professions to, to commit crimes. Just finally, then coming on to, to my own, as it were, cohort of, of young women, mostly young women who, who were working in Poland, um, I suppose I was interested in how the situation of being a Reich German um, in Poland um, elevated women somehow to the status of masters, overcame the sort of gender subordination and, and, and enabled them, so to speak, for, on the basis of their ethnic and racial status to exert authority in ways that they might not have done in the old Reich. Of course, a shortage of personnel, the, the, you know, the, the overstretch, the imperial overstretch actually also opens up opportunities for women simply to step up and take on roles that they might not otherwise have taken. Um, I mean, my sense is that the gender division of labour did still apply 
in, in many contexts that, you know, men were still given the job of direct um, coercion and violence and women were sort of brought up the rear and um, then sort of cleared up and made things ready for the settlers. But sometimes it seems to me that simply for staff short, you know, uh, you know, something happens rapidly, you're short of staff. The police take along a group of women who actually get involved in expelling Poles from their farms and homes, um, who are there to stop the Poles taking the stuff with them. So they become actually quite hands on alongside the police in at the scene of expulsions. And these seem to me moments where the, the, the boundaries between male work and female work start to break down. Um, partly because of this sort of supposed urgency of the task, and partly because of the status of Reich Germans in this colonised territory. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, Sarah, would you like to comment, uh, respond to Liz's question before we move on to Wendy? Um, sure, yeah, I, I think just with regard to um, Auschwitz, um, I have not seen a, a whole lot of, I, I haven't been able to discern a difference that they, um, a, a divide necessarily or strict divide between uh, women who were conscripted and women who weren't. Um, there seems to be just a, a, a pretty high level of violence uh, all around in Auschwitz. Um, but that could be, that could be different elsewhere. Um uh, I, I'm not quite sure about that. Um, and I did want to just comment briefly on the idea of, um, of, you know, this, this opportunity for racialized violence as sort of subordinating the, um, the gender hierarchy. I definitely see, think, see that happening, um, uh, in Auschwitz where, uh, women, um, participated in, uh, um, uh, sexualized violence against, uh, um, men and also against women. And I think that's sort of a demonstration of, uh, at least in part of, of women taking a, say, sort of taking a prerogative that's, um, sort of allowed by them being in a, you know, racially superior category. Great. Thank you very much. So, uh, we're still, uh, answering, discussing the question by what routes did women become mm. perpetrators? And I'd like to bring in Wendy, please, for this, uh, question. In um, Hitler's Furies, I try to uh, kind of delineate that by taking the biographical approach and show how these women kind of made their way to the Eastern territories, to these crime scenes, and the paths that they took, kind of different career trajectories, different ambitions, um, voluntary or, or actually, you know, deployed um, uh, because they had the uh, labor requirement um, in, the, in the German system. Um, and I, uh, so I think that these biographies are really important for showing that transformation and that change over time and the kind of awakening or, or the, even the moments of, of, in these women's lives where they had the quote uh, opportunity, they had to make a decision on the spot, kind of ad hoc involvement, um, but mostly through these different professional tracks. And so I think that, um, first of all, in this history, uh, it's important to um, look at the biographies because we see, we can then chart that transformation um, and we're not isolating the events of the Holocaust and they're kind of freezing them at the crime scene and suddenly people, you know, are there and they're, and they're active. Um, so that's important for a historical kind of biographical explanation. But also to think about um, women's history more generally, in this case in Germany in the 20th century, which I was uh, keen on trying to do, and that's the emergence of a kind of modern state, the emergence of these different professions, the emergence of women as politically active, having gotten the vote um, after the First World War, the generational differences that are there, and, and this uh, overlay of kind of traditional women's history, to what extent um, that intersects with the Holocaust or is transformed by the Holocaust and those existing, uh, you know, preconceived kind of gender roles or gender tracks um, how they are uh, transformed or how they're um, um, maybe potentially tested, right, as far as what women are supposed to be, um, uh, uh, behave, how they're supposed to be behaving as kind of nurturers or so forth. So the perversion of that um, during uh, the crisis uh, and the extreme violence um, and, and revolutionary kind of upheaval of of genocidal um, uh, state-sponsored programs. So these professional tracks are really important. They, they uh, within them, they have their own kind of cultures. You know, whether it's nursing or the growth of the modern bureaucracy, uh, welfare work, 
uh, missionary work, women in, you know, in all sectors of um, society feeling like they are making a contribution to um, some, something greater than, than themselves, but actually also asserting themselves. Um, uh, now, I had thought in my book when I traced some of the violence of two perpetrators, um, Petrie and Aldfather, um, I looked at their violent acts. Um, Aldfather, who was killing Jewish children um, in the ghetto and in Vladimir Volinsk, um, and Petrie, who killed the Jewish children on her estate in Western Ukraine, as a kind of moment of uh, self assertion and a perverse attempts at self fashioning because they presented themselves in different um, ways that would be, um, the, Erna, Erna, for instance, was a kind of typical kind of housefrau with her husband um, on the estate. And Altfather was this secretary who also uh, was very um, trying to, uh, she embraced the colonial kind of um, mentality of, of being in part of the occupation. So I thought of it in, in that way of a kind of perversion in a time of normative upheaval. And then a colleague, uh, uh, Elizabeth um, uh, Yodin Forgi, Forgi um, she kind of tested me out on that and got me thinking about a different way of understanding it, that she saw that this kinds of, these kinds of acts of violence um, or exercises in genocidal power, as she called it, were about the space in which they operated and what were kind of gender uh, domestic uh, spaces and spheres. I mean, these are blurred in her um, interpretation, as we all agree. These are uh, we can't draw these hard lines between the public and private as such. But the women who, who, in this case, who killed children or who felt like they had the authority and the ability to to beat, um, you know, weak Jewish men or Polish laborers or Ukrainian laborers or the mentally and physically disabled. Um, that that was uh, a part of an extension of what they thought was, um, Alyssa says, the kind of an extension of the domestic sphere. The fact that these sites of, of violence were do, often domestic settings, um, the households of the commandant, so the wife of the commandant, so that setting, or, or Patriot's estate in, in Western Ukraine in the household, uh, or Johanna Altfather um, going to the um, infirmary in the Jew or the children's section of the um, infirmary. Uh, that those were um, when we talk about like the opportunity, so to speak, of women exerting this, uh, manifesting this this violence and this power. That's very important to look at the settings. And obviously, the eastern zones are absolutely key to that as well, um, because suddenly women in this kind of hierarchy of power, whether, you know, existing within a patriarchy, but suddenly there is a new pecking order and they can in fact exert their power over this, the racial kind of inferior enemies, which uh, my colleagues have been talking about. So the settings, the professions, um, the various roles um, and the perversion of those uh, roles, but certainly um, trying to understand that under a broader uh, uh, history of the entire century or across generations, not um, focusing too much on um, the event, but putting it in that bigger context. Thank you. I mean, it's, it's so interesting what you say about the attention to spaces and micro spaces uh, across time and place as opposed to event driven narratives. So uh, as a non-specialist in this area, I'm looking forward to seeing how gender studies and gendered approaches can kind of disrupt also approaches to how perpetrators are studied more generally um, and given all the approaches to how they have been written by mainstays in Holocaust historiography, uh, for example. So I'd like to bring in um, Laura, please, uh, for her comments uh, about by what routes did women become perpetrators? To me, the takeaway from both my research and what's been said is there's no one route, but all of the routes are gendered. Right. And I think that that's something that's really interesting to read across all of these different themes. Um, and they're often both gendered and sexualized, which is, I think, something that's really important to pay attention to as well. Um, but I think that I'll let the other uh, people's empirical research speak for the question and let you move on to the next one. OK, great. So the next question, I'll start with you then, Laura. What, if anything, do we learn from looking at how female perpetrators were presented at the time and or are studied in hindsight? I think that we learn a lot about the ways in which gender was understood at the time and the ways in which gender is understood in our own readings. 
at least for me, what motivated my starting to research politically violent women was actually my own shock at discovering politically violent women. Uh, because I studied gender long before I studied women's political violence. And as I started coming across politically violent women, it surprised me and confused me. And I realized that I was making the argument that women are capable of everything men are without their flaws, instead of uh, kind of understanding gender more holistically, even though I didn't mean to. And one of the things that I've learned in studying a number of the narratives of women in the Holocaust is that still some of the, especially newspaper articles and magazine articles that describe them, describe them in really sensationalist terms. Like, look how crazy it is that a woman did this. And like, it's no crazier that a woman did this than that anyone did this. It's crazy that anyone did any of these things. It's awful, right? Um, and so to me, I think we learn what it is you assume the word woman has particular contents in order to be able to say, well, this is how women perpetrators are framed, or this is why women perpetrators do it and differently than male perpetrators. And I think that the distinction that was made a couple of minutes ago about uh, biological sex having very little to do with it and gender stereotypes having a lot to do with it shows in a lot of the representations. Um, I also think that the the monstrousness is often played up, right? Um, so, like, look how awful this woman is. And also the femininity of some of the women's perpetration. So I use the example of someone using tattoos as furniture, right, and things like that. There's often a domestication of the understanding and presentation of women's crimes. And then that domestication is made to sound it, make it sound worse. Like as if someone, for example, who removed people's tattoos isn't gross just because they didn't use it as furniture, right, uh, or something like that. So there's like some extra added uh, kind of shock or horror that we as readers are supposed to see when we associate femininity and the violence. And to me, I learn a lot then about what we mean by femininity more broadly by reading those accounts and the ways that they frame gender. Yeah, I agree. I mean, in terms of the rhetoric of representation, scholarly representation, but also, you know, in uh, even legal representation uh, or the law, this would be, uh, I think, a relevant kind of area for what you just talked about. So I'll go to Wendy, please. Um, what, if anything, do we learn from looking at female perpetrators, uh, how they were presented at the time and uh, studied in hindsight? Well, I don't think that, I mean, when you say at the time, um, certainly, and my colleagues can um, weigh in on this, I can't think of, you know, within the Nazi context, so contemporaneous to as the events were unfolding, the representations of women were, you know, largely dominated by the propaganda machinery and a lot of the, you know, the kind of um, um, promotion <laughs> kind of machine and imagery of, of Goebbels' organization um, and, you know, and the kind of the mass media, as it were. Um, and that, you know, those reinforce these kinds of stereotypes of, you know, the Aryan woman, the, the nurturer, you know, the very things the, um, of innocence. I mean, we even see, um, you know, in cinema, cinema, Nazi cinema, and some of the cinema after the war, um, these various characterizations. Um, of, of female innocence or those who were uh, then brought into the courtroom, like Ilza Koch, of these, what Laura was referring to, kind of freaks of nature, right, driven by their erotic urges and all of that. Um, so there were these various representations, but there was no kind of language at the time of like female perpetrators or, you know, the way that we study um, genocide history in, in, this, in these categories. Um, or the way we have this historical perspective that I just referred to as far as women entering into these revolutions and into the modern workforce, which included a genocidal system. Um, so that kind of perspective was not there. It was just, you know, um, the Holocaust is this massive catastrophe, the world turned upside down. You know, as it's happening, I think, you know, it's hard to really try to reify these and kind of pin these down because it is a time of normative upheaval. And so there are these kind of aberrations or these kinds of revelations and what we're seeing the capability of women or what's possible, you know, in a particular 
um, context. And it's been taking us kind of decades, I think, to sort through that. So if you look at the situation in real time, say in 1945, 1946, and then the pursuit of justice the first 10 years after the war, which was the most intensive kind of roundup, um, you know, there are some women who are being um, uh, hauled into the courtroom because they're guards, they were in uniform, or they were nurses. There's documentation because they're in the system. Um, we're not getting any sense of female kind of um, participation in crimes at that time, really um, uh, outside the bounds of a formal agency, right? Like, um, but we know they're part of the scene, the mass movement, the support roles, as we've been describing today, we started to get into that um, more detailed history. So that, you know, this is a discovery in a way um, uh, of, of, of both, you know, rereading existing sources, scholarship, the various currents in scholarship that kind of brought us to this point. Um, so we can't really go back, uh, given that we're kind of figuring this out, to say a prosecutor, when I think about prosecutors who question some of these German witnesses, including the perpetrators, um, that's not, that perspective is not there. I mean, that understanding, um, and they're existing in a very um, gendered patriarchal environment um, within their own um, uh, generation. So if they're questioning one of my accomplices in my, uh, for instance, um, one of the women in my book who was uh, a secretary uh, in Lida. And, you know, she's uh, talking very, uh, in rather stark terms, vivid terms about what she witnessed um, to the Jews who worked in the workshops there and the thousands who were killed um, uh, near Lida. Uh, and the um, interrogator notes at the end of the file that, um, uh, the, that uh, this German woman you know, was crying um, as she as, as she was giving her testimony. Well, first of all, I, I don't know about my colleagues, but I have not seen notations from interrogators in the West German system, the East German system, Austrian or Soviet system, in which they make these notes about women um, uh, defendants, um, you know, crying, um, and the the way that these questioners. Ex Interact, interacted, you know, it was just a kind of soft approach. Okay, you can go home. Um, and the reality is that this this particular um, woman who was actually not a defendant, but being questioned about her boss's crimes, um, she was in love with her boss, and she was crying because this was part of a wartime relationship, um, a very a love affair that um, didn't work out, and. Um, after my book came out, the, the daughter contacted me through a journalist and provided their love letters and all this, you know, so there was this, that was her, that woman's perspective of, of the war um, and that, you know, kind of lost love. So that's just, you know, I think interesting to also, or very important to, as you're reading the uh, trial testimony and the interrogations and looking at the trial history, looking at um, how notions of guilt and innocence are very much um, gendered and very much filtered through kind of the stereotypes of the day. And many of the women actually were, were rather skilled if they were guilty of serious crimes, like Sabina Dick, the secretary in the Gestapo office in Minsk, knew very well how to play that game with the interrogators as far as what their expectations were and could, could kind of play up to that, uh, which I also think is interesting, um, that self-awareness on the part of, of the women. Great. Thank you so much, Wendy. Uh, I will bring in Liz uh, to examine this question. Uh, what, if anything, do we learn from looking at how female perpetrators were presented um, at the time, uh, if relevant, uh, or are studied in hindsight, please? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think just following on from, from, from what's already been said, I think, I mean, I think the weird thing, and I haven't quite sort of thought the whole thing through, but perhaps the others can help, um, seems to me that gender stereotypes in the courtrooms and in the press in the post post-war period were working in in actually con they could work in contrary directions um both in the courtroom and and in the press i mean you know, women could be considered because they they were associated with with nazi crimes as so transgressive that they were aberrant examples of, fem of femininity and therefore somehow get as it were, treated more harshly or, or stigmatized more more strongly, or they could, and I think that was what Wendy was um, sort of indicating towards the end, perhaps, 
they could slide out of responsibility by playing the card of unpolitical woman, um, ignorant, not interested in politics, uh, not really to be taken seriously as a, as a, as a political actor, and, um, and therefore somehow infantilized. And, and that was quite a, that was quite a, uh, a useful strategy to, as it were, exonerate themselves that they weren't actually really to be taken seriously and they had to have no particularly important role. So I think, you know, on the one hand, uh, you know, women could be, as it were, stigmatized more strongly than, than men, or they could be taken less seriously. So it could work either way, I think. Um, I think, obviously, the press went to town on a few spectacular cases, um, but I'm not sure quite how the press reporting of the more run-of-the-mill um, uh, concentration camp guards were who didn't have a sort of big personality or story to, to tell. Um, in terms of what, what we learn today, um, what does it help us understand? I think it understands... It helps us understand generally Nazi crimes and, as I say, and, and the Holocaust as a project for which the entire associate society was mobilised. I think um, it shows us the ways in which the dynamics of heterosexual coupledom can be bound up with the perpetration of violence. That's very much where, where, where Wendy has, has contributed really important insights. And also here too, I think we've both got this um, interest in the colonialist imperialist context where female agency um, has been enlarged in the name of the national future or historic destiny and and that is it, it enables a sort of role as 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 frontiers woman standing their ground along with their families but also in their on their own terms i'll stop there what kinds of frameworks have you adopted in your research for interpreting women's roles as perpetrators persecutors and accomplices uh, and or how has your research problematized those categories and or introduced uh, new description, uh, descriptors. So the aim of this question is really to get to the uh, discussion about how we interpret uh, women's roles and also deconstructing the idea of the perpetrator, so to speak, uh, and what kind of language do you think uh, is appropriate uh, for descriptions? Yeah, thanks. So um, I haven't adopted particular frameworks for interpreting women's roles in Auschwitz. Um, instead, I've sought to recognize and understand different groups of women affiliated with the SS in Auschwitz and their degree of commitment to the project of genocide. And when thinking about this question, I, of course, thought of Wendy's framework of witnesses, accomplices, perpetrators. And I think that framework works really well in the context of the killing fields um, with particular behavior shaping each category. In Auschwitz, we, we see a similar range of behavior um, from, from women, uh, from watching to supporting to uh, outright murder. Um, the issue at Auschwitz, though, I think, uh, and this relates in some aspects to, sort of, to perpetration in general, male perpetrators as well, is that the most violent group was not necessarily the group that was most committed to Nazi ideology and genocide. Um, so I think what I'm saying is that there's a, a difference between legal guilt regarding specific acts um, and historical. So there's a difference between legal guilt and then um, and historical responsibility for creating the space for a broad array mm -hmm. of such acts to take place. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about perpetration, I think we need to take both of those those things into account. Um, in Auschwitz, the most violent group of SS affiliated women, the guards, was comprised arguably, at least of the of the least committed people to the project of genocide. The qualification standards for, to enter the guard corps were, were low, and many guards were conscripted. Um, few were enthusiastic volunteers and even though it, it, and but ultimately many of them became enthusiastically violent once they became guards um ss wives to varying degrees for sure um supported their husband's work in auschwitz they ostensibly had to meet racial and other standards in order to marry their into ss families although some of these um people were older and so had been married before the nazi movement um came to the fore, um, and many, many certainly bought into Nazi ideology. Um, the SS auxiliaries, the telecommunication experts, so-called SS Helferinnen, were actually female members of the SS. They were part of a core of women that was recruited from Nazi organizations and meant to offer a pool of potential brides for SS men. They had to meet similar racial criteria 
volunteered for their positions, and they received extensive training and indoctrination. They also had to exhibit enthusiasm for the Nazi cause before admission to the Corps. These are the women who appear in the Hooker album, eating blueberries and frolicking, frolicking with the SS men. Um, actually, the, the, one of the photos from that album was on the, the cover slide for this, um, for this, uh, for this um, panel discussion. In many ways, these women, even though nonviolent, were perhaps the most complicit with genocide. I see them as, even though less powerful, akin to Eichmann and other uh, mid-level bureaucrats whose hands were not red with blood, per se, but whose minds and hearts certainly were stained by the death of many. I'll stop there. Great. Thank you very much. So we'll turn to Liz, please. Okay, so I, I, when you asked me to talk about framework, I suppose I actually went right back to the 80s and the 90s because when I, and, 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 and Claudia Kuhns, um, because when I started my research, I was both intrigued and dissatisfied with Claudia Kuhns's use of a classic feminist trope, which was set separate spheres, to analyze women's role in Nazi Germany, and as she saw it, to, to women's role, um, to, to, to show how actively women helped construct the Nazi state. And she used it, as I read it, um, in a dual sense, both to mean the older idea of a gendered public-private divide in which women were assigned to the home, and uh, in a slightly different sense, um, to suggest that there was a female zone in the public sphere within which Nazi women created a sort of world of womanly politics focused on welfare and education in the Nazi sense. So this, that was sort of the, you know, the 1980s. And for me, and, and thinking about it now, there's, my, there's some mileage in this, of course, but I think we've got further on. And I suppose I just wanted to make a couple of points about where I think we might be further on. Firstly, in terms of thinking about the private sphere and privacy in Nazi Germany, I think we now have a more differentiated view of the function played by private life, mm -hmm. thinking of the regime, private life both as a realm to be controlled and policed, obviously, but also as a privilege to be granted and upheld for Germans deemed loyal and valuable. So, you know, private life was something of a, a reward and, you know, I suppose the, the you know, the, the girls and the men eating their blueberries, frolicking is, is, is also part of a sort of private life to be enjoyed as, as a reward. Um, mm. um, Claudia Kuhns also talked about women creating homes as refuges for Nazi killers. Mm. Now, of course, there's, there's some mileage in that to this day. We can think about those cases. But Wendy um, also showed how the wives of Nazi killers were not necessarily just consoling and, and propping up their menfolk, but actually sometimes stepping over a whole lot of lines and becoming active partners in crime. And when I was looking at um, women, work, German women working in, in occupied Poland, I was thinking about, well, is there, a, is there a female sphere here that they are creating? And I suppose in terms of spaces and settings, I felt that in some cases, yes, they were creating a sort of female world in this occupied territory, the Osteinsatz camp or the School for Settlement Advisors. And sometimes that was a, a womanly world. And sometimes it was a refuge, I think, from the dirty work and the, the violence that was going on outside their walls. But of course, sometimes they were part of, of a village and they were exerting authority in the village there was there was no sort of separate female sphere at all so I suppose I in when you encourage me to think about frameworks those are the sort of frameworks I was thinking about and that's sort of where I've got to since. Uh, Wendy would you like to comment please? Um, I think it's it's I think the field um, has started to expand um, ideas of, of female participation in a, in a much broader kind of nuanced way, which is, and, and of course, uh, Liz is just talking about the, the, the spheres argument that goes back to Claudia Kunz's work. Um, although she was a great, uh, she that's a masterful work, Mothers in the Fatherland. Um, and she did tease out, as did um, Gita Sereni, the kind of dynamic between the men and the women and started to understand that as a force um, unto itself, whether it was a normalizing force or a radicalizing force, but that was important. 
um, to show the, the importance of those relationships. But this high idea of women um, participating in all these different ways um, uh, is important to delineate, to find these patterns, because we can then look at other cases of genocide and see some similarities as, as far as spaces where women tend to um, uh, achieve more power and exert more power in kind of purity campaigns and demographic campaigns, education and indoctrination, um, so active in the schools, active in the propaganda ministries, in the administration of persecutory measure, measures, kind of bureaucratic functions, in the consumption, the looting of victims' property and its redistribution, um, also in the suppression of the crimes by destroying the evidence as a kind of clerical um, undertaking as well, um, and providing alibis after the war um, for their perpetrator colleagues um, and mates. Uh, I don't think that women's perpetrator motivation differs much from men's. I mean, they're human beings. They share similar emotions, ambitions, and desires, um, fear, hate, greed, status seeking, attention seeking, you know, ideological convictions, nationalism, imperialism, anti-Semitism, racism. So um, to try to, you know, draw comparisons between men and women and, and argue, you know, some of those overstate some of those differences is um, uh, Potentially not. I think the patterns are, are, are useful to discern because I think it will help us in these other cases. When you look at Cambodia, uh, you look at Rwanda, you look at ISIS um, and terrorist organizations. Um, how is it that in these other contexts, uh, women kind of find their way? Um, and lastly, I really liked um, Sarah's comment, too, about being clear about legal culpability versus kind of more broad responsibility for being participating in these regimes. So as long as, as although my book had those categories, victim, perpetrator, bystander, accomplice, um, and those are useful when you're trying to uh, determine um, that kind of criminal guilt, it's not helpful, you know, as, as historians and, and also in our work trying to compare to other genocides that, and even for the women who come out of those regimes to accept responsibility, uh, um, and, and participate in then the redress, participate in the, uh, the post-war aftermath history in more active ways of memorialization and education and so forth. So the Nazi example, I think, um, when we move into a broader understanding of the history of women's responsibility for the Nazi debacle, you know, instead of narrowly um, defined by these criminal categories, that, I think, um, is really important for prevention and for writing the histories of, of other genocides as well. Great. Excellent. Thank you. So we will turn to Laura, please, for your comments. Yeah, I think that one of the things that I've learned both from the work of other speakers on the panel and more generally from my research is that uh, there's a deep problem with the kind of taking for granted the victim-perpetrator dichotomy. Um, so that is, uh, in political science at least, sometimes uh, this victim status is used to excuse perpetration. So like this person isn't a perpetrator because they were victimized first. Um, or uh, if you are a perpetrator, your victimhood is not understood. And if you're a victim, then your perpetration is excluded. And to me, one of the overlaps in a lot of these categories are important to pay attention to, right? It doesn't make you without agency to have been victimized and then become a perpetrator. Likewise, uh, many people in the course of perpetration also endure significant abuse. Um, and that's the case in a lot of these accounts, especially of women in prison guard positions, lower prison guard positions, things like that. So one thing that I think that I've learned is that I kind of got into the field telling myself stories of idealized victims and idealized perpetrators. And when I go looking for any of those, they don't really exist. Um, and instead you see these very messy stories uh, where victimhood perpetration and moral responsibility kind of overlap and uh, end up being messy and confusing much more often than they're straightforward. And I think that that to me, along with thinking about the world that these people live in is a gendered world like the world that we live in, um, I think are important kind of frameworks for me. Excellent. Thank you so much, Laura. And to uh, all the panelists for 
uh, answering uh, these questions. And I would like to, uh, in the time we have left, open up the uh, discussion to uh, attendees. And you can ask uh, a question either by raising your hand or typing a question uh, into the uh, chat. So we'll have around uh, 10 minutes or so uh, for questions or comments. Uh, if there are any, but I think I would just like to ask a general question uh, to uh, the panel. I think, you know, from listening to your discussion uh, tonight, it's, it's so varied and so so rich and deep, and um, it's kind of impossible to kind of generalise about the topic. And as Wendy said as well, in terms of casting a long net, a historical, temporal view, but also uh, situating women's kind of... Uh, roles um, insofar as the uh, particular context, but opportunities and structures uh, in which they uh, operate. So that's just uh, putting a comment uh, to the panel. But we have a question uh, that I'd like to ask, and it's uh, I was very interested uh, from Kate Docking by Professor Lauer's comment about linking the history of female perpetrators with the move towards recovering women's history. Traditionally, this style of writing has praised the actions of women can we then apply this approach to female perpetrators of the Holocaust, given that their behaviour doesn't deserve celebrating? Is this perhaps a new brand of recovery history with different aims? So I, I think that uh, undertaking this work, work is, is, you know, not, well, should not be driven by a, a sense that any of our subjects should be um, kind of celebrated or uh, it's, um, an attempt to kind of reconstruct what happened um, as much as possible. Um, and those subjects of the past, uh, uh, you know, we, we can judge them once we, once we have, we put the story together, we can um, pass some judgment on them, especially these, uh, the women who committed this violence and committed these crimes. But I um, don't think of agency in that qualitative way of, of, or even um, women's history as a story of, uh, while there's been much progress in the 20th century in particular, um, that is not a, uh, that's not the only story. Um, and we know um, in historical studies more generally that to uh, buy into a kind of teleological narrative of, of advance and progress, um, you know, overly, too rigidly, obviously, um, is a distortion of, of the past. Um, and we're looking to uh, re represent it as, as close to reality as possible, which is obviously not that simple. Um, so I, I don't think of women's history or men's history or the history of Western civilization or global history as any kind of having any kind of underlying spirit to it, uh, uh, good or bad. Um, but to look at these episodes and these events in the case in this case of genocide, um, uh, as growing out of this history of both an idea of, of a utopian progressive world or one that fights against that. Um, so we, we can't really, there are modern forces here, anti-modern forces, progressive, illiberal, illiberal forces, um, and where we situate women in that um, um, historically uh, is really about how they, how they behave in their terms and the documentation we can find of, of their actual um, behavior, but not whether or not it conforms to some sort of expectation of nurturing or progressive or uh, or success, uh, the march of, of the empowerment of women. Um, uh, it's about uh, increasing agency and um, examining to what extent that empowerment was um, utilized for good or, or negative uh, ends. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, we have a question, uh, a raised hand from Jonathan Leader Maynard. Are you there, please, Jonathan? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Could you Great. please ask your question? Yeah, so I'm uh, a comparative scholar of genocide and mass uh, killing, and I work on the, just finishing a book on the role of ideology. And in um, a lot of this scholarship, there's been renewed emphasis placed on the link between processes of militarization and securitization in genocide and mass killing. And obviously, militarization and securitization itself is highly gendered, as much of your work uh, between you shows. And I'm wondering if this means that the role of, as it were, war waging, Martin Shaw calls genocide a form of degenerate war, 
I'm wondering if the role of war waging is, is very different for female perpetrators precisely because of the way in which war waging is gendered. So is it, put, put really bluntly, is female perpetration of the Holocaust much less linked to the notion of waging war than male perpetration of the Holocaust is? Or is this a bit of a false distinction? Is that not a helpful distinction to be made? It was a really great panel discussion, can I say as well? So thanks very much. Uh, thank you so much, Jonathan. Uh, who would like to answer that question? Uh, we have Wendy, uh, Liz, Sarah, or Laura. Um, so I think the my answer to it has a lot to do with thinking about the ways that war at home rhetoric ends up playing a significant role in women's behavior in war and conflict more generally, and certainly in the Nazi war effort, right? So like... Uh, one of the trends that international relations scholars recognize is that women have a more active role in all aspects of society, often during war and conflict. Um, and they do because there's some gender role exceptionalism that comes up during conflict uh, that says, all right, well, like this situation is desperate enough that women can be real people too. Right. Um, and, and that's probably a crude generalization, but I think that, in a lot of sense, it's actually exactly the militarism and the kind of war attitude that ends up causing the openness of places for women to get involved, right, in more ways than maybe they would have when war rhetoric wasn't happening. So that's, I think, my related observation. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll just move on to some uh, additional questions, given that the time uh, um, theoretically at the end, but we hopefully take a few more uh, questions. This one is a Holocaust-related question uh, from Marion Kaplan. Thank you all very much. I'm interested in how these women treated children, Jewish and Roma. I assume incorrectly, with a question mark, that women may have had some jobs related to children, those who were not immediately murdered. Would Wendy or uh, Liz or Sarah like to comment on that? I don't want to say that the, the, um, I mentioned this a little bit in the other part of the program um, as far as this pattern of, uh, which goes back to uh, pre-existing kinds of roles and, um, uh, and spaces and women um, in the household, women as the nurturers, the maternal figure, um, and how that kind of, uh, overlaps with these professional tracks, right? So the welfare work, the work in that we know, you know, one of the one of the few defendants in Gewermitz in Nuremberg, she was in the Rossum, the, the race and resettlement office and was involved in these massive kidnapping operations and bringing the children into German adoptive households and administering that. And, you know, as a welfare worker and, and uh, Professor Harvey knows more about this than I do, but um, yeah, this this pattern, and I alluded to it before as well with Alyssa von Jun, um Forgi's work um, of the the women and children, whether they're the uh, captured children who are then going to be put into German holes and Germanized, or the Jewish children in the case of some of my perpetrators, um, and their targeting of Jewish children as kind of the most um, vulnerable or the fact that the Jewish children maybe in these cases felt safer around a kind of maternal figure didn't expect this German woman to uh, to lash out and be violent. Um, this, the, But the, the presence of children within a kind of orbit or sphere of these women's lives and to what extent they uh, lived up to that gendered role of, of being nurturing or whether they transgressed it because that child was considered a kind of enemy of the Reich or a, a blight, a you know, parasite kind of a racial view. Uh, we also know that child rearing practices were really important. There's some new work, um, or longitudinal study of child rearing practices and socialization of children in Germany and the perpetuation of very abusive and kind of violent child rearing practices that um, pretty much um, uh, you know, influenced generations that were very violent in the Holocaust. So um, this is a really important part of this history. And I suspect that if we look more closely again at other genocides, we'll start to see um, some of these patterns um, in either the uh, abduction of children, abuse of children, uh, in ISIS camps, sexual slavery of children. It's, um, you know, there's, there's quite quite a lot there to, to uh, study. Okay, thank you, Wendy. Uh, I'm just going through a few more questions. I'm conscious of time. Uh, one question is, where do women prisoners 
uh, from Barbara Rilko Bauer. Where do women prisoners as perpetrators, accomplices, fit into the studies and analyses of women perpetrators during the Nazi era? It's a very big question, but I'm not sure if we can answer that succinctly. Who would like to uh, answer or have a comment on that? So I was actually initially in my comments, but I, they would it would have gone over the time allotted. I was going to talk about violent women and functionary and privileged positions, and um, yeah, I'm yeah, this is tough. I, you know, I, I I'm reluctant to call them to call them perpetrators, um, but then you know, sort of getting to what um, Laura was saying earlier, I think it's important not to not to sort of gloss over um, the idea that some some victims you know cross the line into perpetration and. Um, and not to discount the sort of some of the horrible experiences that um, that perpetrators had. Um, so I don't know what I want to say about them, uh, except that there is so um, in Auschwitz, uh, um, women functionaries, um, prisoner functionaries uh, were in charge of the daily operation of the camp. And many survivors recall more instances of violence at the hands of other prisoners than even at the hands of, of, uh, of women guards. Um, so I think in some ways, I think, hmm, um, just, I, I guess, you know, I, at the end of my comments, I was talking about this sort of like high, you know, this kind of in terms of like thinking about, you know, individual violence, you know, guilt for individual violence versus historical responsibility. And I would say in terms of historical responsibility for genocide per se, that these women are, are, are very low in the, in the, um, in the hierarchy of responsibility. Um, but they do have, you know, they do have, but they were, some of them were extremely violent and some of them murdered other people. Um, I don't necessarily think they, they are among the group that should have been, and, and they were in this group of the, uh, among the group of, who were put on trial and executed in the immediate aftermath of the Holocaust. Um, but uh, I think there's, they're important people to talk about. So I feel like they, 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 they complicate our understanding of, of, of kind of the dynamics of violence. Um, but at the same time, I think it's really important that we not identify them as, as sort of like, um, as, you know, really critical perpetrators of, of the Holocaust. I think that's what I want to say. Although I go back, you know, I, I argue in my head about this too. So. So we will go to a next question. Um, Wendy, did you want to comment before we go on? Well, the only thing I wanted to mention is the prior question about Martin Shaw's work on degenerate war. Um, or talking about social political responsibility, none of the women obviously at the time self-identified as a perpetrator was really um, like making, in a way, a kind of big conscious decision to, to you know, okay, now I'm, now I'm going to commit this crime. I mean, they're, they're within a context, historical context of, of being at war, of being a patriot, of of standing up against the enemy, of an existential war. Not this is a where you know a, a, a campaign that bleeds into literally into the civilian zones that you know is behind the lines and on the front line. And you know so that that whole context of you know survival of the nation, um, survival of women who are part of the survival strategy because they are the the procre you know reproducers or the bi biological um, role that you know they were expected to to carry out so on behalf of the regime so um you know if if they're not understood and and we know this from genocide studies as part of this massive um uh reality of, of mobilization and participation as a national to even totalitarian kind of participation um if the holocaust is kind of cordoned off in one corner or the crimes are in one part of of, of the occupied territories and all these things are kind of segmented or this person's a perpetrator, that person's a victim. It's not history writ large. And as long as we don't see it as that kind of uh, broader history, um, uh, then women can, and, and all of us who look back on that history can continue to perpetuate that notion of innocence or separateness. Um, and that doesn't, um, uh, uh, just doesn't, um, isn't, isn't real. And, and again, is not, um, going to help in terms of uh, future study of genocide and genocide prevention. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, the next question from Cherie Robinson. What are your thoughts on Michael Rothberg's idea of an implicated subject? Would you consider this an additional category that is in addition to perpetrators, victims, bystanders, witnesses, and any combination of them all? <laughs> 
but I, I will have to go and do my homework and find out more about Michelle Rothberg, Michael Rothberg's, uh, Rothberg's idea of the implicated subject. It's new to me, I'm afraid. Okay, thank you. We'll move on to um, possibly last question um, because of um, just uh, time, um, or just there's quite a, a few more. So one of them is the study of um, from Harold Marcuse, the study of uh, res rescuers upstand. This is detailed contextual training skills, opportunity, and character traits such as the altruistic personality as factors leading to action. Can these categories be applied to understanding female perpetration? I'm not sure. Maybe he can clarify the connection between altruism, you know, being a positive trait, and how he's um, uh, raised it. Yeah. That, right, how he wants that to illuminate actual uh, perpetrator behavior. Basically, not that the altruistic personality, but whether there's a, a perpetrator personality, sort of a suite of personality traits that. Uh, are more common among female perpetrators than among the population at large or the female population at large. Right. So we know from these various studies that they're, you know, a minority um, uh, are the, you know, if you look at the proportioning, you know, proportional across society, the minority are like the hardcore killers um, and the and minority are the, you know, um, courageous uh, kind of rescuers and there's everybody like in between and and we're pretty much even though this panel is about female perpetrators we talk about women we're pretty much talking about like everybody <laughs> in between and um, although they are obviously represented in those other kind of minority categories of uh, or, or smaller percentages of, of the the rescuers and the um, hardcore killers um, on the side of rescue people have tried to figure out you know what is it that you know, drove that behavior of, of, um, of altruism, as you say, um, in the same way we try to understand motivation of, of perpetrators. And I, you know, as I mentioned before, the women shared the same kinds of motivations that men did in terms of their um, emotions and their drives and what they were capable um, of do doing. Um, and it, do but it does have this, this kind of um, gendered element, whether it's things happening in the domestic sphere or patterns of perpetration vis-a-vis -vis children um, uh, or perversions of kind of gendered roles. But uh, I don't think that um, we've come up with any kind of understanding of a female perpetrator type that um, in a way that we've looked at kind of altruistic, um, the, the tendency towards altruism in the way that person was kind of raised or so forth. I, that to me, I don't, I couldn't speak to. Maybe one of my colleagues has a sense of that um, kind of type. I think it's conceivable one could develop a typology of that. It's not something that I've tried to do. I think the study of the, you know, Wendy's sort of approach through biographies is, is really important. I also tried to um, map uh, common elements and differences in terms of, 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 of training and skills and opportunity. Um, but I think, yeah, um, that's an interesting suggestion. I'm sure we can think about, we can, you know, go away and think about it. But it's it's certainly not, not a framework that I've tried to um, use in my own work. Okay, great. Thanks. Just by way of uh, closing this panel, I'd just like to ask the uh, panelists uh, to briefly, if possible, um, offer if there are any areas um, in research on gender and perpetrators that uh, merit further studies from scholars, and if so, what are they? So we can start with um, Laura, if you're there. I think there are a lot of them. To me, I'm interested in the way that women's sexual violence is framed differently and understood differently than other political violence that women uh, commit. I've recently become interested in the way that sexual violence and reproductive violence overlap. So those are kind of the questions that I have going forward in the, in the near future. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, Sarah, do you have any uh, comments about that? Um, yeah, I, I'm also interested in in women as perpetrators of sexualized violence, and I think there's there's, to my knowledge, there's very little um, actually there's very little work that's been done about the Holocaust. Um, but I also haven't read a whole I haven't seen a whole lot of um, 
of uh, witness testimony about it either. So um, that's that's something that I'm looking into. Um, and then I think also um, just for me with regard to Auschwitz, um, I uh, I'm really interested in if, you know both Wendy and then Alyssa Mylander and some of her work and then uh, others have explored some of the gender dynamics between men and women in the context of of the of killing sites. Um, and I haven't really been able to find a whole lot of information about that about um, Auschwitz, but I would love to. I think that that's an area that could that could produce some really interesting um, scholarship. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, and Liz, please. I suppose one thing that occurred to me is that it's not that there's no work being done. Um, Andrea Petto is working on, on Arrow Cross women in Hungary, but generally the, the larger picture of um, collaboration, uh, women and collaboration across occupied Europe. I mean, thinking still about Nazism in the Second World War, but um, I think there perhaps is room they, for for some more comparative work on uh, female collaborators in these in, in the occupied countries. However, however rare they may have been um, in in terms of their ac activism within the native fascist movements across uh, across these different occupied countries or allied countries like like uh, like Romania. Excellent. Thank you very much. And Wendy, please. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so one of the uh, issues I brought up at the beginning, which I think uh, just to integrate, you know, to so show how gendered, uh, st gender studies on kind of sexism um, of the time uh, intersects with these other isms, to put this reality of kind of sexism in the kind of the discourse, the more predominant discourse of kind of nationalism, militarism, um, uh, you know, anti-Semitism, racism, and to, you know, have it kind of be part of those explanations in a in a in a more um, integrated and more prominent way, and then Liz mentioned you know non-German women and including ethnic German women you know who were in these territories in the eastern zones, and you know to look more closely at how these women um, were kind of socialized and um, those those different paths that we talked about kind of biographically, um, and then I guess also something I'm a couple other things I'm intrigued by first of all. Um, this more uh, in the private realm or more intimate realm or um, impersonal realm of relationships um, uh, and also households, you know, domestic violence, marital rape, um, and things that are going on uh, that are maybe priming certain uh, societies to, to accept um, women in, in violent settings or, uh, or violence uh, more generally. Um, uh, whether it's a male head of household meeting it out or if a woman at home who's um, kind of complicit in that as well. Um, so that's those are some of the areas. I um, also came across some really interesting divorce records in Munich uh, that go from 1900 to 1945. There are uh, all these cases, right? And I, that would be interesting to see how women um, navigated this situation. Um, um, through these mechanisms of, of, uh, of marriage and divorce um, during the Nazi era, immediately at the end of, of the regime. Um, and so these kinds of, um, uh, where, where can women kind of uh, navigate a system, right? Not just professional paths, but what are the, the spaces where they can um, actually or, or in the churches or stuff like, actually where we can find more full expression of their reaction to, and their involvement to the Nazi um, so-called revolution. Well, thank you uh, to uh, the panelists for a provocative, uh, informative and enriching panel, and also to Laura Schoberg of the Gender Institute, uh, to the Holocaust Research Institute and the Centre for International Security for co-sponsoring this panel and once again to the panellists for their uh, preparation and of course for their uh, scholarship. Long may it continue.